Porosity and permeability are two terms that in everyday speech probably are used in the same way, but as they pertain to hydrogeology, they're two distinct things. Permeability is a general term. You can think about a surface that's permeable, right? Think of a sponge. Now, you might also think of a sponge as porous, but porosity is, we'll get into that, that's a slightly more distinct and quantifiable metric. Permeability just means that something allows fluid to transfer through it, right? So something like a sponge, you know, that'll soak up some water, and then it'll, you can squeeze it out of it. It allows water to flow through it. Something like the ground, you know, you think of dirt, rock. When it rains, the rain doesn't just chill out and sit on top of those surfaces. It will eventually soak through no matter how long it takes. And thus we can say that those surfaces are permeable. Now porosity, on the other hand, like I said, it's something specific and we have an equation to describe it. N, that's our symbol for porosity, I don't know why, is equal to the volume of the void space divided by the total volume of the material. So you can think of porosity as a specific percentage, right? It's the amount of void space per unit of volume of your rock or soil or whatever material you're working with. So porosity is really interesting, right? We can work with this. We can do some number crunching with something like porosity. We can find out how much water a material in an aquifer will store. We can find out, you know, how much volume is there, how much space is it. If we want to look at water flow underground, right, we've got to have some idea of how much water can be stored in situ at a given point in time, right, in that mass. So we can do a lot more with porosity than we can with permeability. Once again, quantifiable versus general. Now there are several factors that impact the porosity and these are packing, grain size, and mixing. These all affect our N value. So I have here a little illustration to demonstrate the packing portion of it. We have two types demonstrated here, cubic and rhombohedral. Cubic packing is a little bit less efficient than rhombohedral, right? If you look at it, you'll see that we have several spheres here representing grains, and this is in two dimensions. But you can kind of think of, you know, we've got little squares here. If you were to draw lines between the centers of these circles. So you can think of in 3D, it would be cubes. And because there's only, each sphere has only two tangent point connections with the spheres surrounding it, at least in this depiction, you get a lot of white space in there. You can see there's quite a bit of white space representing pore space. So the porosity of this cubic packing, in fact, is going to be about 0.4765, so 48% rounding up, right? Rhombohedral, by contrast, is going to be at about 25.95%. So rhombohedral, significantly more efficient packing, which leads to less porosity, right? Because those solids are going to be consuming more of that void space. You also notice the rhombohedral, you can think of it geometrically, right? There's one, two, three tangent connections on this circle, which is analogous to this circle as compared, as compared to only two on this guy. Now there are other things that impact the porosity, right? You can, working with these bases, these packing geometries, we can change the grain size distribution Distribution is a key word there, and the mixing. Now with grain size, what we're really looking for is a good distribution of grain sizes, like I said. Just these pictures on their own, right? It wouldn't matter what the size of these is, right? There's no scale. It doesn't matter if these are the size of bowling balls or the size of golf balls. If you have cubic packing, it doesn't matter how big or how small they are since porosity is about a ratio. It's the ratio of void space to the solid. So obviously with something the size of a bowling ball, you'd have a lot more void space, but because you've also just got a lot more volume, you're gonna have the same porosity as you would with something smaller. So the grain size distribution, which we quantify with this metric down here, CU, which stands for the coefficient of uniformity, that's going to tell us D60 over D10, that's the grain size for which 60% of the grains in the specimen are smaller 
divided by D10, that's the grain size for which 10% of the grains in the specimen are smaller or finer. So a higher CU, right, is going to indicate a larger spread of grain sizes. If you have something like 5 millimeters diameter is your 60% mark, and something like 0.05 is your 10% mark, that would indicate a huge spread, which would generally lower your porosity. So a larger spread of grain sizes lowers your porosity, and you can just think about that like this. Take our unedited picture and start doing things like this. Let's say we start fitting some of these smaller grains in these spaces here. What's that going to do? Well, it's not going to increase the total volume, right? Because those little grains, they're going into the little spaces that were already there in the material. But it is decreasing the void space. Okay, so we're decreasing the void space without increasing the total volume. That's going to create a smaller numerator in the same denominator that's going to decrease our porosity. And the same would apply to the rhombohedral packing. Mixing is the other thing. It doesn't matter if you've got a whole di large distribution of grains. The one I drew here happens to be well mixed as well, which is an important factor. And well mixed means they're going to be really, you know, you're going to have that smaller size grains in the spaces between the larger ones, as opposed to, you know, the other option would be having smaller grains. But what if they're all lined up over here? and they're just kind of off to the side of those larger grains. Well, that doesn't really help then, right? Because we've just got more cubic packing. You've got a transition, you know, this the, the point right here, the, the transition line, that's probably going to have a lower porosity, so it might lower the net porosity a little bit. But by and large, you're just working with cubic packing, just varying sizes. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is a couple different kinds of porosity. So I defined porosity and there are a few different ways we can break it down. The first is primary porosity, which is the stuff that forms while the, the pore spaces that exist while the rock or soil is forming. So you can think of this guy on the left here as something sedimentary, right? Look at that. You probably think, okay, if these are grains of sand or silt or clay, and this could easily be like sandstone, siltstone, mudstone, right? And these little spaces in between, those are just the inevitable spaces between the grains because, as we showed earlier, you know, you can't pack them perfectly. You're going to have something cubic, rhombohedral, somewhere in between where you're just going to have void space. So it's just going to exist. Secondary might exist in something like an igneous rock, where igneous rocks in general, because they form with crystal growth and crystals, you know, they grow at the microscopic scale. It'd be very hard to get water in between a lot of them. It's going to be very, it's going to be a lot less permeable for the most part. But then secondary porosity is something that happens after the rock is formed. So let's say, you know, classic igneous or metamorphic rock, it starts to fracture. You know, let's say it's on a, it's in some mountainous environment. It's experiencing a lot of compression. And so you get these fractures, these joints in the rock, and that's going to create porosity as well, of course, because it is void space. Water can travel through there. And it does nothing to the bulk volume that the material occupies. Now the question down here, which has a higher effective porosity? So I'll define effective porosity real quick as well. That's the porosity that really we care about, you know, effective well, what's, what's effective? It's a measure of the amount of water that it can hold. That's what we're most concerned about in higher geology, right? We're not so concerned with just void space in general, we're concerned with the applications of that, you know, what groundwater monitoring, engineering, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of applications can we apply to it based on the void space. So we're not looking at things like void spaces that are too small to hold water or void spaces that are just going to be completely blocked off, say, in something like shale. We're interested in what's going to actually allow water to move through it. What are the spaces that are actually going to do interesting things? What are, what's going to let us say, oh yeah, the water moving in there, it's going at this rate, 
it's going to experience this much resistance and how can we apply that to things like the movement of contaminants that kind of stuff so effective porosity right which one do you think would have the higher effect of porosity having that definition now, of course, it, it really does depend, but in general, we'll see that primary is a better indicator of effective porosity. Why? Because it's more consistent. Things like fractures, of course, you could have a really well-fractured material, but a lot of them could be things like dead ends. And then those we don't really care about in terms of effective porosity, right? Because, well, it's not going to, it's not going to really allow it to trans, to trans, to transfer through the material itself. It's going to be able to store it but there's no real use for that, right? So what? I mean, maybe in some rock mechanics applications, you would say, oh, there's there's water stored in that joint, so it's creating water pressure, which could create easier failure and shear. But for most hydrogeology applications, we're not going to be concerned with that kind of thing. So primary is really going to be where we're going to see the most effective porosity, especially because a lot of times with these grains, it's going to be relatively consistent throughout, right? And that's going to create a consistent path of water flow. And you're not going to have a whole lot of instances of, you know, really small grains completely impeding water, uh, internal fractures that are going to be completely unable to store water, that kind of stuff. So primary, secondary, and effective porosity. Finally, I thought I'd round it out with a little bit of an example here for us to work through, make sure we understand what porosity is. So the setup is this. A rock sample with a volume of 0.75 three quarters cubic feet is oven dried to remove all the water within it. Once a constant weight is reached, so constant weight of course would be indicating that you're monitoring the weight as it's dried. And when it stops changing, you know that you've completely removed all the water within it. It's evaporated out and it's just a solid. The dry sample is submerged in a tank that contains 10 cubic feet of water. Okay. The specimen is removed a long time later. That long time should be an indication that, okay, we've reached a steady state. It's no longer soaking in more water. It is completely saturated. The new volume of water in the tank is 9.8 cubic feet. What is the porosity of this rock and what type of rock would you expect this to be? Okay, well, let's look at this. So we know that our initial volume. What is our initial volume? Well, it's 0.75 cubic feet. And you can think of that as the total volume, the rock sample plus its void space, right? However they measured this, we were just given it. And that is the complete package, 0.75 cubic feet, okay? The specimen is uh, submerged in a tank that contains 10 cubic feet of water. Okay, well, what's, what's that trying to get us at? Well, we go from 10 cubic feet to 9.8 cubic feet after it's removed a long time later. So the specimen gets completely saturated. And by the time it does, there's been a change. So we'll say the volume of the tank, V sub T, initial we said was 10 cubic feet velocity of the t <laughs> velocity volume of the tank final we say is 9.8 cubic feet and then using this just a little bit of subtraction we'll say that the change in volume of the tank is equal to 0 0.2 feet cubed and i guess technically that's negative because it lost but the thing we're looking for here is, okay, let's think about this conceptually. The water that left the tank had to have entered the rock. So this means that effectively, this is equal to, because it has achieved steady state, this is equal to the volume of our void space in the rock. Okay, so then remember that equation. N is equal to the volume of the void space, which we have, divided by the total volume, which we have. So that's going to be equal to 0.75. Excuse me. It's going to be equal to 0.2 divided by 0.75, which is about equal to 
27%. So that's the porosity of this rock. And then the second part of the question, I just threw that in here. What type of rock would you expect this to be? Going back to what I said earlier, generally s s sedimentary rocks will be the more porous ones. I would put this in the range of a lot of sedimentary rocks. It would be a bit high for a carbonate, but I would say that this is pretty, this would be well within reasonable range for something like a sandstone. So let's just call it a sandstone. Probably not an igneous or a metamorphic rock, though exceptions do exist to everything. So of course nobody would ask you this in real life. Oh, I have a porosity value for it. Take a guess at the rock. It would be more like, you know, if you're assessing a rock mass, then you would look at the type of rock first. And then if, say, laboratory testing, doing this kind of thing, oven drying it, doing submergence tests, if that was too costly, monetarily or time-wise, then you could use a range of values, an average, an estimate for the, the in-situ rock mass. So that's a brief introduction to porosity, permeability, different terms we use with porosity and different things that affect it. Hopefully that was interesting.